Tonight, a very ominous subject. The Antichrist. Who is he? What will he do? Why will God allow him to come to this world at the end of this age? What's his true function? And what does Jesus say about him? What does the Apostle Paul say about him? And the Apostle John and the book of Isaiah and the book of Daniel. And friends, it's amazing how much space, time, and words are devoted to this monster of iniquity, this satanic masterpiece who will dominate the entire world for the final three and a half years of this age. Well, friends, let me introduce him by showing you, first of all, a couple of pictures, if we may, and maybe we can dim the light slightly just for a few minutes here, please. All right. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at the whole direction of mankind toward the Antichrist throughout history. The Tower of Babel project was to replace the Lord with a man-made humanistic system. And God mercifully smashed the whole project and scattered people to the ends of the earth, from which event we have never yet recovered. Then, of course, in more recent years, Karl Marx and the whole mentality of communism that replaces God and his precious word, you see, with a so-called communist paradise that resulted in millions of people being destroyed. I and my father were in Europe in the Second World War. And our target, of course, was a monster by the name of Adolf Hitler, who actually succeeded, we still can hardly believe this, in conquering most of Europe within two or three years. And that's what we shall see the Antichrist will do. Okay? Amazing things God is preparing us for, isn't he? And, of course, his great Third Reich collapsed and has never reappeared. But nevertheless... We have the great society of modern liberalism whereby we're supposed to have the whole world enjoying peace and prosperity without the Lord. A man-made system, okay? The New Age movement, mystical utopia, and the end-time world mystery Babylon system of Revelation 17 and 18, the Antichrist. So you see, friends, you can go back through history and see that Jesus is in charge even though he said on one occasion in particular this is your hour and the power of darkness it's not that God is helpless standing by wringing his hands as if he can't do anything to stop this God has a purpose friends to drive deep into our conscience the awesome option alternative of his way and man's sinful depraved choices okay next picture now, of course, the book of Daniel is going to tell us some things. And Jesus introduces Daniel to us. Did you know that? Jesus never named Antichrist. But he described him. Would you like to hear this? The only statement Jesus ever made about the Antichrist. He said in John chapter 5, verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. But... One is coming in his own name, and him you will receive. Israel will receive the Antichrist, as we'll see in the book of Daniel in a moment. Okay? And what else did Jesus say? The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, was written by Jesus Christ through an angel to John. And Jesus says in the book of Revelation, something he will do to, to break the, the seals... The seven seals that represent what? The title deed of the universe. And the first seal he opens is this one in Revelation 6.1. He breaks the seal and says, go. And the Antichrist is launched. You say, I can hardly believe that. You mean the Antichrist is launched by the Christ? Well, of course, friends, you don't think, do you, for one moment that Jesus has lost control of the world. No, no. He's in charge, even the most horrible time that is yet to come. He's in total charge of everything that happens during the 70th and last week of Daniel that we looked at yesterday. Those final seven years following what? The rapture of the church. Okay? A time of enormous darkness and tragedy. And yet, 
of divine victory. Okay? Now, the Lord Jesus said something else that assumes we know we're talking about the Antichrist. He said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoso reads, let him understand. Then let him who is in Jerusalem flee. Don't go back for your property, your goods. Flee for your lives. Because then will be a time of tribulation such as never was, no, nor ever shall be. Now that's the only book of the whole Old Testament, friends, that Jesus specifically recommended you understand. What book was that? Daniel. In Matthew 24, 15. Okay? So let's do it. Shall we obey Jesus for a few minutes here? All right. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. Can you find it? Daniel chapter 7. Let's begin, please, with verse 7. Because, as you probably are familiar with the book of Daniel, in the second chapter of the book, God had given to Daniel the explanation of the great image that he showed to Nebuchadnezzar. You remember with the head of gold and the uh, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, brass and arms and legs of iron and feet of clay. Okay? And that represents the whole stretch of of ancient and modern history, Neo-Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Macedonian Greece, the Roman Empire, and its final form down here, which will take place during the final tribulation, the feet and the ten toes. Okay? Now, when you come to Daniel 7, you find the same four empires, but in a different form. Ravenous beasts all attacking each other, you remember. You have a lion and a bear and a leopard and then a monstrous thing, this fourth kingdom of Rome, is indescribably horrible. Now take a look at him, would you, at verse 7? Are you there? Daniel 7, verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed trampled down and remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now watch this. Chapter 2, the fourth kingdom had ten what? Toes. In the seventh chapter, the fourth kingdom has ten what? Horns. Representing the final ten kingdoms at the time of the second coming. Okay? Now, what is new in chapter 7? Look at the 8th verse. Here it is. While I was contemplating the horns, these ten horns, behold, another horn, a little one, here's an eleventh horn comes up now, among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. He's a brilliant blasphemer. Hmm. How awful. But all of a sudden, from this despicable person that we are asked to look at, we are ushered immediately to the third heaven to see the God of creation, God the Father, and then God the Son. You just can't get more different between verses 8 and 9 of this chapter. Now look at verse 9. We're in heaven now. Are you ready? And I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat and his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames and his wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads. That's 10,000 times 10,000. That's hundreds of millions. Were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Then all of a sudden, God directs our attention back to this horrible monster on the earth the little horn, the eleventh horn, who turns out to be the Antichrist. Now watch him. Verses 11 and 12, are you with me? And then, 
I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. And as for the rest of the beast, that's Medo-Persia, excuse me, uh, Neo-Babylonian, Medo-Persia and Macedonian Greece. You remember the, the head, the arms, the belly and thighs? You remember the lion, the bear, the leopard? Those first three kingdoms, what happens to them? Look, an extension of life was granted to them because they didn't disappear when they were conquered. They were just absorbed, see, into the next kingdom. But this fourth one is different. The kingdom of the Antichrist, friends, will not be absorbed by Jesus into the, into the millennial kingdom. It'll be totally destroyed. Now watch. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. And I say, well, Lord, tell me what you are revealing here about how the world will end. All right. Now, again, we're hurried back to the third heaven. Verse 13. And I kept looking in the night visions. Remember in that previous glimpse into the third heaven we saw whom God the Father now watch and behold with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man was coming that's Jesus and he came up to the ancient of days that's the father and was presented before him and to him was given to to this son of man was given what dominion glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That is the only picture in the Old Testament of God the Father. And Jesus the Son comes to him to receive the kingdom. Now friends, like a true Bible student, Daniel says, I want more explanations here. Okay? Now this is fascinating to me. How God views a perfect Bible student. Now watch. Verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions of my mind kept alarming me. So if you walk out of here tonight and say, I've got it all figured out and I'm peaceful, you missed the point. You didn't hear it right. We're supposed to be, friends, greatly alarmed at these things and motivated to learn more so that we can help people avoid the catastrophe that God is predicting will cap happen all over the world. Don't miss the rapture and be left behind. That's the message. Now watch. Verse 16. I approached one of those who was standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. That's good. Thank you, Daniel. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. And he describes those four kingdoms. But you see what Daniel wanted to know, verse 19, I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, that fourth kingdom, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with teeth of iron, claws of bronze, which devoured and crushed and trampled under the remainder with its feet. And he wanted to know what else? The meaning of the ten horns that were on his head, and especially what? The other horn which came up and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which was larger in appearance than its associates. And I kept, now here, this is new, never before had this been revealed in the Bible. Look, verse 21. I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. He's going to kill millions of God's people. Do you see this? Israelis and their converts among the Gentiles. Millions of people will die for their faith. The saints will be overpowered. My, can you, can you see why Daniel is absolutely obsessed with this issue of what's happening to his people Israel in the future? Verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest, by the highest ones, and the time arrived when he, the saints took possession of the kingdom. Oh, thank you, Lord. The saints at last will win. Okay? And the kingdom is going to come at the end. May I say it this way? 
we have looked at the end of the Bible and Jesus wins. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. There's hope. Okay? But in the meantime, very tragic things are predicted to happen in the world, especially to believers. Okay? Now, as you look at verse 23, we're going to get more precise on what's going to happen. And I wonder if somebody will kindly give us another picture on the screen here. Thank you. Here we are. The 70th week of Daniel. The great tribulation time. As we saw yesterday, the church is raptured. And then begins what? Israel's 70th week and Christ's second coming. The second coming will be our study, God willing, tomorrow night. Tonight, the inauguration of the little horn who will conquer the western kings and kill the two witnesses, set up the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem, and dominate the whole world, the whole human race. Okay? Now Daniel's going to tell us the two parts, the two parts of this 70th week of Daniel. Are you ready? Verse 23. Then he said, that's the interpreting angel, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise. Those horns represent kings or power centers, you see, of the world, the western world. And another, here he comes, will arise after them, and he'll be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Now, the way a Jew is to recognize the Antichrist when he comes is this, among other things. He will conquer three Western kingdoms. Well, who is he? Well, I'll give you an opinion. I think he's going to be an apostate Jew. Why? Because, as we'll see in, Re in Daniel 11, he is condemned by God because he does what? He has forsaken the God of his fathers. Now, in the Old Testament, you can't say that of a Gentile. Because for a Gentile, he must abandon the God of his fathers or gods. But for a Jew, that is apostasy. So Israel will turn to an apostate Jew. Now, whether they'll see him as Messiah or not remains to be seen. Watch carefully how this develops. You ready? Now, verse 25. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints. There it is again, like we saw back there in verse 21. He will wear down the saints of the highest ones, of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they, that is the saints, will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. Now, what you just saw in verse 24 is the first three and a half years right here. He's going to take over the Western kings of Europe. In the last three and a half years, he'll do what? He will speak against the Most High, total blasphemy, wear down the saints, persecute believers all over the world, and try to change all the fundamental systems of the universe. But he'll only have one time, two times, half a time. That's one year, two years, half a year, three and a half years, and he's done. See? Right here. That last three and a half years is the most awful time the world will ever know. Okay? Now, friends, flip over quickly to Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 25. You say, well, this is getting complicated. That's why Jesus said, whoso reads Daniel, let him understand. Because you cannot understand Revelation, which we're about to look at, until you have first got the basic truth from whom? Daniel. Thank you. Here we go, friends. Daniel 9, 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, There'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks, 483 years. The very time Jesus appeared, exactly according to the prophecy. Okay? And it'll be built again with placid and moat, even in times of distress. 
those first 49 years, those six, seven weeks, were times of great struggle in Israel getting established back in the Holy Land. Then what will happen? 26. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. In other words, humanly speaking, he's finished. And you know that most of the historians of the world today, and I studied under some of the great ones at Princeton University, believe that Jesus was a marvelous man, a great man, a significant man, but when he was crucified and died, he's finished. He's gone. Oh, really? Guess what happened three days later? Thank you. Guess what's yet to happen? Thank you. He's coming back. May I make this announcement? Jesus is alive and well right now. All right? Thank you, Lord. But now, look at the last part of verse 26. The people of the prince who is to come. Another prince is coming, friends, who will be the opposite of Jesus. He's the anti-Jesus, the anti-Christ. And he'll destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a, with a flood. Even to the end, there'll be war. Desolations are determined. And he, that is this coming prince, verse 27, will make a firm covenant with the many, the majority of Jews, for one week, one seven-year period. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years after the covenant is confirmed, he will do what? He'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. That's the abomination of desolation. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. What's that mean? Well, friends, that says there's going to be a covenant, a treaty. Right here. When the church is gone, Israel will be desperate for a leader. And by the way, watch them now. They're more and more desperate every day, every week, every month. For what? Significant, recognized, reputable leadership. Okay? And all of a sudden somebody will appear who is obviously brilliant and clever and will make a promise. And he'll say something like this. I will lead you. You give me your military, you give me your finances, your expertise, your intelligence, and you and I will make a team together for a seven-year period. And he'll make it firm. That's the Hebrew wording here. Make a firm covenant with the many, the majority of Israelis, friends. And what will happen? Three and a half years after he makes this covenant, he'll break it. Right in the midst of the seven-year period, three and a half years later, he breaks the covenant and causes what to stop? The sacrifice and the oblation. The zebak and the minka in Hebrew means the bloody sacrifice and the meal offerings. He'll stop them. You know why? Because he hates the whole program of sacrifices on the altar, in the temple, in Jerusalem, totally. He has to compromise his convictions to have Israel follow him. He'll go along with those who say, well... We need to have a place of worship, sir. And we're going to have it right where it belongs, in the temple in Jerusalem. Now that, frankly, requires some miracles to happen. Who did we talk about last night, friends? Anybody here that was here last night? Who did we talk about that suddenly also appears on the scene, just at the same time the Antichrist does? The two witnesses appear. Yes. And they are supernaturally empowered by God. Elijah and Moses, I believe they are. We know Elijah is coming. Jesus said so. I think his companion will be Moses. So you'll have the representatives of the law and the prophets in Jerusalem with vast reputations and credibility and power from God to attract attention of the entire nation to their message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah of Israel. They're going to preach and proclaim that message of the gospel. And thousands, yes, millions of Jews will believe them during what? The days of their prophesying, right here, right under the nose of the Antichrist. Now, wait a minute. How is this going to work? Friends, this gets complicated. It really does. 
And of course, the biggest problem most of us have is this. Why do we have to have animal sacrifices again anyhow? And the reason is because we're talking about Israel, not the church. See, the book of Hebrews is written to Christian Jews who were tempted to go back to the old system and abandon Jesus, whose blood provided for the new covenant, you see, for the church. And the church doesn't have animal sacrifices because we have a different system. But you know what system Israel has to have to survive? They have to have animal blood to cover them from God's wrath so they can stay alive. And for 1,400 years that happened in the Old Testament to protect them from what? Premature death in the presence of a holy God. See? The animal blood didn't take away their sin but did what? Covered it from God's wrath. Okay? And you say, well, I can't think is Israelite thinking right now. This is difficult. Of course it is, friends, because we're, we're, we're in the church. See? We don't do Israelite things. But Jesus said, when this day comes, you will become very well acquainted with God's guidelines for Israel. He said, pray that your flight will not be on the Sabbath day. Well, that has nothing to do with the church. See? He said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the what? The holy place. Well, we don't have one. But Israel does. It's in Jerusalem, in that temple. Okay? And the Antichrist, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, will set himself up in the what? In the temple of God. Showing himself that he's God. In what? In the temple of God. Well, we don't have a temple of God. But Israel does. Jesus said, in effect, get tuned in, dear reader, talking to the Jews. When Israel is restored, we're going to have a temple and an altar and Zadokian priests and animal sacrifices. And you'll have to tune in to the Israelite leadership of the religious world under God. Well, now you have a tremendous tension between the Antichrist, who is Satan's masterpiece, and the two witnesses who are God's representatives, the forerunners of Jesus, second coming. You see? And what's going to happen? I mean, these two witnesses will be stupendously successful in winning Israelis to the Messiah Jesus. You say, how do you know? Because Malachi said so. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, before this final period comes. They will come first and do what? And change the hearts of the fathers toward their children and the children to the fathers. They will convert the people to the Lord and families. And you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 17? Elijah indeed will come first and restore what? All things. He'll succeed where John the Baptist failed. He will win the nation to the Lord. With a few exceptions, of course, as we'll see later. But think of it, friends. They will lead the whole nation to the Lord right under the nose of the Antichrist. And he hates them with indescribable hatred. And therefore, he has an opportunity he's building up to see. He's winning the Western world. By the way, he's conquering Europe. You say, well, how can one man conquer Europe in three and a half years? Hitler did it in less than three years. Anybody remember Hitler? Thank you. Incredible. The man was a complete demonic maniac and 50 million Germans followed him to death. I can't believe this. Can you? I mean, can, does this make sense? No. Satan has a master person. David, you know, was preceded by an anti-David whose name was what? Saul. So Christ will be preceded by an anti-Christ, the beast the horn okay I say Lord this is so complicated well friends we're just getting warmed up turn to chapter 11 <laughs> Daniel 11 verse 36 <laughs> now he's going to describe what this king will be like this beast this antichrist this little horn look at this are you there? Revelation, excuse me, Daniel eleven thirty six. And the king will do as he pleases. That's why he's often called the willful king. 
and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and he'll speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He'll prosper until the indignation is finished and that which is decreed will be done and he will show no regard for the god of his father's Elohim, God. Okay? Nor will he show regard for any other god and or, or, or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other God, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, verse 38, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Guess who that foreign God is? You guessed it. Satan. That's his God. Okay? And he'll give great honor to those who acknowledge him. He will cause them to rule over the many and parcel out the land for a price. Now, a very complicated paragraph begins. And this is widely misunderstood, friends, by Bible students for many years. Look carefully at verse 40. What's going to happen to him? The Antichrist. Look. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him... And if that weren't enough, the king of the north will storm against him. Now look what you've got, a pincer movement, right? All of a sudden, a southern king attacks him. Well, what great king south of Israel would that be? A king of Egypt, see, in Daniel's day. Okay? And what great king is there from the north that could attack Israel? An enormous empire way to the north that has to come through countries to get to Israel. Anybody can imagine a country north of Israel up there, maybe north of Turkey somewhere. Uh, may I suggest one? Russia. Thank you. Now watch what the king of the north is going to do to him. He'll storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He'll enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will enter the beautiful land. That's the Holy Land. He's coming down with his armies, you see, and his ships. And many countries will fall, but these will... Re Rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of Ammon. He's going to bypass Transjordan and head straight down through Israel. And finally, he reaches what? Egypt, verse 42. He'll stretch his hand against the other countries in the land of Egypt, will not escape, and he'll gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt and Libya and Ethiopians, that's to the west and south of Egypt, will follow at his heels. But, all of a sudden, this great monstrous king of the north who comes and attacks and gobbles up the king of the south that he had as an ally, see, in the pincer movement, he stopped in his tracks. Why? Look. Rumors, verse 44, from the east and from the north, that's the Holy Land from Egypt, will disturb him. And he will go, he'll abandon his whole Egyptian, African campaign go forth with a great wrath to destroy and annihilate many and will pitch his tents, the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas, that's the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, just south of Jerusalem. And the beautiful holy mountain, that's Jerusalem, yet he will come to his end and none will help him, period. You say, wait a minute. What's going on here? Do you, you see the picture? you see why this is very difficult and mysterious? Here's the, the final great king. Verses 36, 7, 8, and 9. And all of a sudden, a king of the south attacks him. And then a king of the north attacks him. And he's sort of trapped in between. Guess what happens? As the king of the north heads right to Israel, he kills the Antichrist and heads to Egypt. And all of a sudden, in Egypt, he hears something horrible has happened. The Antichrist that he killed has come back to life again. So the king of the north comes back with all his armies to wipe him out and all of a sudden the armies of the king of the north evaporate in fire. They're gone. You say, where do you get that idea? From Ezekiel who gives the details about Gog from Magog who comes into the Holy Land and is wiped out by fire from the Lord. You say, really? Are you sure of that? That the Antichrist is killed and comes back to life and sees his greatest enemy annihilated by fire? Yes. 
turn to Revelation 13. Now, you remember in Revelation who's talking, don't you? Jesus says so in verse 1 of the first chapter. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants. So let's see what Jesus says about the anti-Jesus, shall we? The Antichrist. Chapter 13 of Revelation. Verse 1. And he, that's the dragon Satan, from the previous verse, stood on the sand of the seashore representing the human race. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, out of humanity, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were the ten diadems, on his heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, a bear, a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been what? Slain, killed, and his fatal wound was healed. He rises from the dead. Now, jump over, please, to verse 12. And he exercises all, that is, the, the, the false prophet, exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was what? Was healed. He died and was raised again from the dead. Look, look at verse 14. This false prophet deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, now watch, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Wait a minute. Who kills him? Someone with a sword. And the book of Revelation assumes you've already mastered Ezekiel and Daniel, see? Ezekiel 38 and 9 and Daniel 11. Oh, really? You mean the Antichrist is killed by the king of the north and goes down into the abyss, the realm of the dead, and somehow he comes back again from the dead? Amazing. I thought only Jesus could do that. Oh, you know the difference, don't you? When the Antichrist comes back from the dead, he's like everyone else who's ever come back from the dead as a mere person, a mere human, namely, to die again. But Jesus came back from the dead with a glorified body, and he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Jesus is the only one who has ever risen from the dead with a glorified body. And what a horrible discovery for the Antichrist to come back from the dead and find he, he has a mortal body. Well, who manages to get him out from the dead? Look, Revelation 12 says that right in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel, Michael the archangel will succeed in casting Satan and his armies down to the earth, knowing their time is short. And they will, under God's permission, bring the Antichrist back from the dead. Now flip back to Revelation 11, please. Look at Revelation 11, verse 7. What's going to happen to the two witnesses who have won Israel back to the Lord? When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, the realm of the dead, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified, namely Jerusalem. And it tells you what's going to happen to the two witnesses. They'll lie for half a week in Jerusalem, but God will raise them up from the dead and publicly honor them as they ascend to heaven, just like Elijah did the first time. But this time with a glorified body. And friends, there you have it. God says, watch this scenario. Compare these passages together. Because what God is going to do through the Antichrist is to what? Prepare the whole world to re realize their desperate need for Jesus and Jesus alone. What's he going to do? 
Well, Jesus said so. He said as soon he's going to set up an abomination of desolations right here in the temple, proclaiming himself to, as God and have an image of himself, a statue by the false prophet that will come alive and kill anybody who won't bow before it. And for three and a half years, folks, every human being on this planet must take the mark of the beast on his right hand or his forehead, or you can't buy or sell, you'll starve to death. And if he catches you, you're beheaded. Billions of people will die. Billions. But thank God, millions of them will be believers who will be martyred. You say, really? Yes. Because Revelation 12 says that when the two witnesses are killed, God will hide the nation of believing Jews for three and a half years. He'll protect them in a special hiding place. He will also protect 144,000 Jews, seal them from, from the Antichrist, so they can do what? the gospel of the kingdom to every nation before the end finally comes. Millions of people will believe and be saved from all the nations and tongues and tribes of the world. And I say, Lord, this is an amazing period of time in which you'll show evil at its worst and righteousness at its best in order to prepare the whole human race to recognize who Jesus is and Israel as his chosen people and the kingdom of priests. You say, Lord, this is astounding. Tell us how it's going to end. Help us to ask questions like Daniel did. Lord, what about that fourth kingdom? What about that eleventh horn? What about those saints that are going to be martyred? What's going to happen at the end of the world? Well, friends, with God's help, that's our topic tomorrow night. Please pray that we'll have an understanding that will honor the Lord. In the light not just of human speculation like who's the Antichrist today? Well, you can't know because he's hidden until when? Until the Spirit of God takes the church away. 2 Thessalonians 2. You say, what's the importance of knowing about the Antichrist? Because the Apostle John says in 1 John 2 and 1 John 4 and 2, and 2 John, he says, there are many antichrists today. There'll be one coming, but there are many today. And here's how you recognize them. If they deny that Jesus is the God-man, if he's God in human flesh for our redemption. And I say, Lord, help me to be discerning because Satan, the God of this world, wants to deceive millions of people. And some of those who are representatives of the antichrist, friends, may be dressed in nice clothing and stand behind pulpits of churches and look brilliant and sound eloquent but they've denied who Jesus is and denied what God says and John says those are antichrists even today let's pray Father help us to understand what you want us to know here some of these things are so complicated and so terrifying in fact we almost want to back off and say, Lord, I don't want to hear any more about this. I don't want any more bad news. But, Father, you know that we can't appreciate the light until we see how deep the darkness is. Help us not to be obsessed and depressed by the dark things, the demonic things, the satanic things happening everywhere. But help us to focus more and more upon that light at the end of the long, dark tunnel of human history. The light that speaks and says, I, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are and what you said. And help us to take seriously, even though it's complicated, the word of the living God enshrined in this precious book. We thank you in Jesus' name and for his glory, dear Father. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' name and for his glory, dear Father. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' name and for his glory, dear Father. Amen.